Hello, this is an EWT introduction on photons and the creation of transverse waves. Now if energy flows as waves and if particles vibrate as they move to minimize wave amplitude, then photons can be described as the transverse component of this wave due to vibration. At first, a little bit about transverse waves and the electromagnetic spectrum. So everything that we see from gamma rays to x-rays to even light, uh, microwaves, radio waves are really all the same wave. It's a change in wavelength as you can see in the diagram. Uh, I'm going to start first with a water wave analogy before getting into photons. In the path of a water molecule, the individual molecule is a good way to illustrate photons. A water wave has both a transverse and a longitudinal wave component. So in this case, the direction of wave propagation is left to right, that's longitudinal direction, and transverse is perpendicular to that. So if we apply this to photons, right, particles always reflect longitudinal waves. That's electric force covered in the video on forces. And as that wave is traveling, if you were to measure it at some point in space in a volume, it might look like that. And that's just captured just the longitudinal part of that wave, the electric force. Now, but also if a particle vibrates, a secondary transverse wave is created while it's vibrating. And it's a traveling wave, and if you were to capture that in time, now it's the photon. It's merged with the longitudinal wave and the transverse component, which is the magnetic force. And the speed of that vibration results in different wavelengths. So a faster velocity is going to be a shorter wavelength, such as x-rays, or a slower velocity is going to be a longer wavelength, such as radio waves. Now to avoid confusion, um, this icon is used in uh, EWT for transverse waves from particle vibration. But first, this is uh, maybe a typical view of how the electromagnetic um, wave is, uh, is illustrated. And I used red and blue in that previous one uh, as an example to show the transverse wave and the longitudinal wave components in the more traditional EM wave view. But how to calculate that energy now? Um, in waveform, here's the transverse energy equation, which is going to be shown uh, in this video and in future videos to calculate the photons of uh, many different atom configurations. And there's really the three variables that you see there separated in parentheses, which I'll explain next. So first off, the, the variables for forces, if you were to calculate, um, is based on particle counts Q and Q1 and Q2 in this case at separation distance R. And that was covered in forces. And the same thing could be done here for calculating transverse energy. But photons can be a little bit different and trickier for two reasons. One, the electrons moving, and we need to consider both the initial and the final distance r. But I think more importantly is the effects of other electrons uh, and that they are at various uh, distances within the, the atom. So it could be done if you were to calculate Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, for example. Uh, but there's going to be many different electrons in uh, atoms, and it gets quite complicated. So instead, a variable uh, here called the amplitude factor, which is going to be explained in atomic orbitals, uh, is used to calculate the wave interference on that one particle as an effect of everything else around it. Just makes it simpler. And the results. You know, from using that equation with these variables uh, is consistent with um, measured ionization energies. It's actually been compared against 250 plus ionization energies, and you can see the URL to the paper there. And more information is going to be shared in the uh, video on orbitals. Uh, this video is going to be more about explaining the photon, uh, and really it's a conservation of energy as longitudinal wave energy is um, transferred to transverse waves or vice versa, uh, because photons can either be created or observed. But in all cases, energy will be conserved. So for example, when a particle vibrates, 
and two photons are generated, calculating the transverse energy there of just one of those photo, uh, photons, uh, ET, for ET for transverse, is half the longitudinal energy because two were created. And there are many different ways that they're created, photons are created and absorbed. Uh, this is some of them, and the equations there on the right just illustrates the conservation of energy. Won't go through all of these uh, details, but I will show examples of three. Uh, but for the details, again, paper uh, below there shows the uh, before and after pictures of all these different types of photon interactions as they're created and absorbed. But to illustrate the conservation of energy, pick on three examples. Starting with this one, which is the photon that's emitted uh, in an atom. Now, in this case, longitudinal waves are just uh, shown as uh, circles there. And those longitudinal waves, and the reason why it's going to be illustrated this way is longitudinal wave energy is now being transferred to the photon which was produced. And to prove that it is um, half the longitudinal energy for hydrogen, the photon's energy is the uh, Rydberg unit of energy, which is that number you see there, 2.1799 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. Now, if you were to use the electric force, so for example, use Coulomb's law to calculate a force, and energy is force at distance, so you have to multiply it by the Bohr radius. If you take half of that, you will find that's exactly equal to that photon energy. It's the same number. So that proves that the longitudinal energy is being transferred now to transverse wave energy to create the photon. That's just one example. Here's another one. Because an electron annihilates with a positron, unlike the proton, it creates that orbit. But when an electron annihilates with a positron, now all of that standing wave energy is going to transverse energy. Those particles are still there. They're now destructive, but they no longer have standing waves, and so all that energy is released and is, uh, produces two photons, and this is exactly what's seen in uh, annihilation. Each one of those photons is equal to exactly the mass of the electron or the positron. And then one final example to illustrate it is pair production, also solving the mystery of pair production, because upon annihilation, those particles, the wave centers, are actually still there. They're just now destructive. Uh, it can't form um, standing waves as a result. But it can return to producing standing waves because waves are always hitting and always being reflected. But if you separate out those particles enough, then they can produce their standing waves again. And it takes a photon of at least two energies, uh, standing wave energies, uh, if not greater, greater just uh, produces more kinetic uh, motion of those particles as they fly away, but it takes at least uh, a photon of two energies of the electron and positron combined. And that illustrates the conservation of energy. And to summarize photons, they are transverse waves perpendicular to the direction of particle vibration, and along with the longitudinal component, it creates the electric and the magnetic components that we see in the electromagnetic wave. And the photon does have energy, but it does not have mass. And the reason why it does not have mass is there's, unlike a particle, it doesn't contain wave centers. And so therefore, there's no standing waves to be measured as mass. And the particle has greater energy as it vibrates uh, faster and produces shorter wavelengths as a result. But in all cases, energy is always conserved between longitudinal and transverse as a photon is either created or destroyed.